Okay, uh, my name's Stephen and I'm going to be doing the first panel. Uh, I'd like you to uh, give a warm welcome to Lucinda Curtis, Mrs. Reagan herself. We've come up the hard way. There we are, that's all right. There. Ancient. She wants to stand there. Ancient now. Okay. All right. Right, okay. We're going to have um, a montage of clips now of your best moments from, from Grange Hill, uh, hopefully to bring back some memories for you. <laughs> okay. Is that the first time you've seen yourself Anything. on Grange Hill? I've never seen like that? any of those films. No, I mean, because I'd stopped, I mean, you, it was much harder to record things. Yeah. You know, you had to have the great chunky thing that you, and I just, you know, after a few months, you don't do it anymore. Was there anything there that stood out for you that, that you particularly remembered? Well, I, I suddenly saw that I actually did do some of this. <laughs> <laughs> because when I got it, the part, I had done a training to be a gymnastic teacher. I'd been, you know, it was something I thought I would do as well as being an actress. And when I told them that, I think they thought, oh, she's fit. She'll, you know. So I realised I got it a bit on the strength of that. Because it, but then they put me in these terrible baggy trackies, and I thought I looked like an elephant. So I said, no, 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 no. I want to be in the Italian <laughs> And then I got a bit wild, and I want to be seen to do some of this stuff. And I see it. I did do some, and I'm well pleased. <laughs> <laughs> what are your memories of uh, the, some of the pupils, some of the child actors that, that worked with you? Well, the first thing that struck me is you go, when it's a new, new series, new season, everybody meets for what's called the read through, and a huge room, and everybody, everybody who's connected with the show is there. The, the actors, everybody. And you go, I went in as an adult with another, um, Miss Partridge, who's a great friend of mine, Karen Lewis. And there are all these, these kids, incredibly cool kids, so black, we're quite nervous. 
Now these kids don't seem at all anxious about being on the first day of the show. And then we're introduced, and the Ron Smedley, the producer, said, Lucinda, this is your daughter, whose name I remember in the show as Laura, but I can't remember her. Fiona. It's Fiona, yeah. What a fantastic looking girl. Ooh, they've given me this beautiful daughter because I really thought she was so lovely, and he was a very nice person. So that was, I was quite, ooh, I thought that, that's what I but the kids were, they, were, they came from different stage schools, and some of them were easier to work with than others. I mean, it was quite significant how the training, or whatever they were being taught, was, was, more, was more specific in some colleges than others. But they all had chaperones as well, because some of them were quite different, so there'd be these lady chaperones. And the people in the makeup got to know the children the best, actually. They were very good, they knew them all. I used to get so muddled with the names of the characters they played and who they really were, because they, you, you were calling them all the time, their character name, and then you'd be having tea, or you would meet them in the, in the makeup, and you wouldn't think, oh, God, who is this person? <laughs> anyway. But uh, you worked, uh, obviously you'd worked before Grange Hill in terms of theatre and television, and you were, were quite a seasoned actress in, in many ways. What was it like working with... Uh, children who were very much at the start of their careers. Well, I mean, they always knew it, which was sometimes a bit anxious, making those of the ones about who weren't quite sure of you. Because it was a very quick, it was a very quick turn in. There wasn't very, any really at rehearsal, it was sort of a rehearsed play, which was still to this day how you do it. No, but they were, I thought they were enjoying it on home, and some of them were very, very good. And I think there's a guy coming this afternoon. Lee, Lee, yes, Lee McDonald. Lee yeah. McDonald, who did the Say No to Drugs. And I thought he was a terribly good actor. And sadly, I believe, he didn't go on with it. But some of them did stick out as being, you know, yeah. really, really good. And he was one I always remember very well. Did you keep in touch with any of the, uh, the, the, the actors? No, no Gwyneth, Gwyneth Powell is a great friend of mine. Um, and she was she was a stalwart. I mean, she was there a long, long time, wasn't she? Um, and Jeffrey Kassoon, who was only for a year, but he's a fantastic classical actor, actually. Has gone all you know, with the Royal Shakespeare Company all over the place. So, and I thought that the quality of the script was terribly, terribly good because the script editor, when I got into the show was this, was Anthony Mingella, who has since died, but who became you know a really, really fine writer of film scripts. Um, I can't really put my name in reading, but but he, as a director as yeah, well. He's very I mean, he was so it was it was classy. I really, really did think. And the storylines, particularly my story, which was to be going to, for the first time into a teacher's home because my child's a question. And then the story of me <coughs> having a boyfriend being a single parent and the boyfriend then making the pass at my daughter's friend. That was quite bold mm -hmm. in that, in that mm -hmm. time, I think. In, in many ways, the series was in some ways working towards being like a soap, wasn't it? It was but a bit. The, the it behind was. the scenes and seeing the yeah. characters' lives and no, that I detail. Was, I was lucky in that, that I had that storyline. I thought that was, because it was, it was just different to being always in the classroom. Did you have a, a good relationship with the, with the script writers and the script editor? Could you have any influence over the way that your no, character was developing? Had, there was one writer in particular, I can't remember her. She was terrible. She always used to say to me, I'm going to write for you. You're the character that most interests me. Because they did it in a rotation. So I think that the writers who did favour certain artists in it, because they liked the, you know, the character, be it a child or, or a teacher. And what about your working relationship with the, uh, the actors who are playing your teacher colleagues as well? I'm particularly thinking about Michael Sheard, for example. What was it like working with Michael Mr. Sheard Bronson? Michael was a tremendous Grange Hill champion. He thought it was the best thing. So, you know. so when we EastEnders started, that was the first episodes of EastEnders, and we would all be in the canteen, 
and my new shares would be hundred. I'll never get up to our rates. So <laughs> and we were all bit skeptical about his, his optimism, but he was an incredibly uh, keen brain chill, brain chillite. And the first two episodes of, brain, of EastEnders went out and the ratings were still not as high as ours. And then as the weeks went on, they got up and up and Michael was looking more and more down in the mouth about it in the course of that EastEnders to come. It was quite fun those first few weeks because there was a sort of challenge and, and certainly that Michael Sheard was leading that we're, you know, we're the winners. I mean, that character was very much loved in many ways in a weird sort of way and so on. I know that he was he very was, proud he of, was, of that role. He was, he was good. Yes. He was memorable because he was so, I mean, and his toupee and everything. The, I yeah. mean, you couldn't forget it. No, he was, he was very professional. Was. And he, he wrote, a, before he died, he wrote a series of memoirs, which is a very important record, really, of what oh, it's really? like for a jobbing actor, because he'd worked in, in Star Wars and, and Indiana Jones and so on, and he was very keen to do as much work as possible. I think he was very proud in saying that he never turned down a role. You know, he would just keep on working, yes, and you know, he just loved the acting business uh, so much yeah, in many was, ways. And then he had, the, the sort of counterpoint to him was Michael Cronin, who was... Mr. Baxter. Yes, yeah. and so, who was uh, uh, there was a sort of both on in the storylines and in life there was a slight sort of they weren't the, the best of right so they weren't enemy but the, you know there was a slight tension okay but, so uh, lots of your work was done at, at Elstree wasn't it and so I was, yes because they always used to do it at the and then they moved it to Elstree. Uh -huh. So, and, and did you do all of your work at, at Elstree? Did you rehearse at, at, at the Acton Hilton? No, 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 we didn't. No, it was all done. All done at, yeah. at Elstree. It, it, that was the first, it, you know, that's the first time they changed it. But we'd, and then it, we'd have extraordinary locations. I mean, the whole of Elstree High Street would be altered all the time. You know, one minute you'd have thought, oh, okay, I thought that was where, oh, no, that was a set. That's not, you know, you'd think it was a coffee shop, then one minute, but it wasn't for real, and you'd get because they used everything they could in the locality. And even like uh, hospitals, we you know, bits mm. of hospital room or wherever. And then I can't remember where we did the, I think the car park was made into the netball court. Do you think it was quite important uh, to have locations uh, in Grange? I'm thinking about the reality of the series, you know, the, the real spaces of outside as opposed well, to mean, the studio. Was, you could always be walking into school and that, the, the Grange Hill, site doesn't mm. look as if it could be a school and it's quite a lot of green around and so walking into school it did look quite authentic mm -hmm. and then if you walk down the high, Elstree High Street it's like yes. many, many. Now did you get any uh, feedback from from teachers about your, your performance? <sighs> no, I mean I think that why it was good was this thing of being out of school Yes. of showing a single parent in an in a domestic in, in that environment. environment. I think that was I think that was good. I mean, I, I the first scene. This is just quite a funny scene. to me. It's a funny story. Before I actually got this park in Rachel, I was travelling in India, and I went to a fortune teller, and he said, "I see you in a space." With many, many, many children. I don't speak very good English. Many, many children and people, and you're standing. In your, and I thought, oh, he thinks I'm an actor. He's got, he's got, you know, he's got somewhere in his head. He's got actor. And then I went back and I got Grangeville, and my very first scene was talking to assembly. And I stood and there was. I just thought that was quite weird, don't you think? I mean, sort of. Anyway, but then the next scene I had, which I was quite surprised that they wanted it, had me very angry. It was, it was, it was in the clip when yes. you nailed that. Really, really angry. And I struggled with this because I thought, how angry can a teacher afford to be without losing it mm -hmm. and shouting? And I, I just still felt there had to be something holding back. And I remember the producer, Ron, came down on the floor, which was very alarming. And the producer actually comes down and says, "No, no, no! It's got you've got to be really brutal with her. You've got to really let fly." Because the bit of me thought, 
and their teachers always have to be so self-controlled. Yes. Yeah. So. Yes, yeah, so I, I mean, it's a very special relationship, isn't it, that, that, that a teacher has with, with a pupil? Yes. But I haven't really realised, and I'm sure now, I mean, you know, I was a, a friend who's a teacher, and you can't do anything, you can't touch a child, you know, none of that. So she said that the best thing I can do is come with me, I say, I've got a mistake in their jacket. Yeah. <laughs> although, although it. <laughs> In a way, uh, teaching and, and lecturing is about performing, isn't it? You know. Yes, it is. A, yes, and you've got the. And you, and and you, you have to remain. Control. Yes. Yeah, but sometimes control. I suppose it's. So yeah. much. Okay, I think we've uh, have another guest uh, yeah. joining us uh, the, this morning. Please welcome Please Chris Jury. <laughs> Lucinda's just been talking to us about her um, memories of, of the show and, oh, yeah. and so on. Um, and for yourself, you started off, uh, it was quite early in your career, wasn't it, that you it played was. Mr. Knowles? It was my second telly job. I'd done my first telly job playing a nutter. Uh, <laughs> what was that called? Mr. Knowles. No, no, not Mr. Knowles. <laughs> this is the other thing. Oh, sorry. And then I'd just done that one thing and then I was terrible in it and it... Was, was it Johnny Jarvis? No, no, that was that, that. Was that right? Okay. And um, it, it was a thing about a mental hospital on BBC Two, and I just played a nutter in that for one episode. And then I, um, uh, and then Anthony Minghella had taught me when I was at university. Anthony Minghella, I'm sure we know, was the script editor for a while on Graham Field. Lucinda mentioned. And he had, he subsequently went on to win nine Oscars and, and is unfortunately dead now, God bless him. Um, and he had taught me at Holy University. He was actually only two years older than me, Anthony, but I'd had a year out and he graduated and become a lecturer straight away. And so he, had, he was a lecturer at Holy University for exactly the three years that I was a student, and he left when I left. And so I came to London and was doing, um, you know, fringe theatre and stuff like that. And he came down, and his first proper job, paid job, was script editor on Grange Hill with Stephen Kenny, <coughs> Kenny McBain. And... Um, was he Kenny McLean? Was that his name? The director. The producer. The producer. And um, they had this part for this guy called Mr. Knowles. And uh, Anthony knew me. I'm originally from Coventry. Mr. Knowles was meant to be from Birmingham. I'm from Coventry. And so he got me an audition and I got the part. And in fact, we're going to now look at uh, some of your. Uh, <laughs> Moments as this teacher who didn't have a good time to begin with. No. I thought thirty years in show business does to a man. Yeah, 
not seen that for uh, quite a while. No, I've seen the first clip in the thing on YouTube because somebody found it and sent it to me cruelly, I thought. At the time. <laughs> <laughs> they cruelly sent it to me. So I've seen that one, but I haven't seen some of it. Some of it I don't remember, I have to say. Um, <laughs> Yeah. yeah, he had a, a, a. He was quite a nice character, wasn't he? He was a lovable character. Yeah, I mean, he did this one episode where he was hopeless. Yeah. And it was an episode about, um, you know, the failure of a of a trainee teacher yeah. and the way that it, you know. Because he was he was uh, he was going to get the sack, wasn't he? He, he was going to get the sack. Yeah. And that, and the, it ended it, with him getting the sack. And then, um, you know, I'm very proud to say that they liked what I'd done and wanted the character to come back, which actually was quite ridiculous, because yeah. they then basically hired someone who couldn't teach in the school, you know. Um, so they... <laughs> so they Does that never happen? They, yeah, that's never happened, no. <laughs> they, they hired, uh, you know, Grange Hill hired, uh, the show hired Miss, me, yes. uh, which meant that the school had hired uh, Mr this. Knowles. And then in the next year, I did two seasons after that, a few episodes in yeah. each. And the following year, he then started to come back a bit, and yeah. because they he, started to the kids started to see something in him, and it changed. A because bit. he he was a bit of an embarrassment to begin yeah. with, wasn't yeah, he? And it, it, but I think it was very interesting that the writers took that on board and how it had the children basically saving him yeah. because they realised he was you know he was all right this yeah. guy at the end yeah. of the day, yeah. uh, which I thought was a very nice sort yeah. of touch. And and I had I I'd, I'd experienced a very similar situation when I was at school where yeah. there'd been a trainee teacher who'd yeah. been no good and then we'd come to see that he was a decent yeah. guy and sort of... So do you think there was a bit of, a bit of an educational message there to kids watching that, that show at that time, you know, about how to treat teachers and whether the teachers uh, you know, should be respected and so on? Well, it depends which episode they saw. <laughs> <laughs> if they saw that first one, they'd have learned to take the piss mercilessly. <laughs> um, what, what about teachers themselves? Did anybody kind of give you feedback? on? No, on the I, never, I never spoke to any teachers about it. Actually, I don't think teachers watch Grange Hill no, because they, they, well, yeah, they were at work. Well, there were, well, actually, there were some teachers who, you know, very publicly slated the series yeah. because they felt it undermined their authority. I don't know if that was something that you thought of, Lucinda, as well. Whether the, the yeah, teachers, true, they didn't, and a lot of yeah. parents didn't like mm. their kids watching it. They yeah. thought that it was far too naughty and you know irreverent. I mean, I think particularly. Around your time, Chris, I think there was a, there was a, a lot of controversy uh, around the show and, and people banning their, their kids from watching. Yeah. And I think, I think it was about two years before there was a news round special addressing this, this debate uh, for, for It kids. is extraordinary, isn't it, that that could be the case. Um, and it, I must say, I was, you know, I couldn't, I didn't understand what the kerfuffle was myself. Um, you know, Grange Hill had started... Uh, when did it start? 78. 78. So it started 78 uh, in a long tradition of British social realism. Um, Phil Redman did have mm -hmm. this idea of showing real life as, you know, uh, and that had come from a long tradition. And, and social realism did tend to be um, regarded by certain elements of the media uh, uh, as being threatening yeah. because it tended to show working class lives in a, in a uh, sympathetic light. Um, but when you look at Grange Hill, I mean, when I was, certainly in the two, three years I was in it, I mean, what? Yeah. Just the idea that it could be irreverent because kids would actually do in the TV show what kids actually did in schools. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm nowhere near as bad as they actually did in schools. 
but perhaps it presented an image of children that parents would perhaps prefer not, not to see. Yes, to be delusional. Yeah, because to I think... in a deluded world. I, think I mean, I went to a grammar school and we locked uh, a trainee teacher in a cupboard. <laughs> <laughs> that was at a grammar school. Not an inner city, you know what I mean? This was in grammar school. But I, suppose, I think and I spent the lessons hiding in this same cupboard with a little old cone in it like that. And whenever he, he, uh, whenever he turned around to the blackboard, I'd go and get in the cupboard and shut the door. And then they'd all just sit there and he'd sort of go... <laughs> <laughs> and then eventually we got him to go to the cupboard and locked him in the cupboard. <laughs> <laughs> and this was at a grammar school. So the idea that kids are these angelic, you know, give us a break. But I, I think a lot of parents wanted to see the, uh, the more children's literary adaptations and things like that, presenting a nostalgic view of the, of the past and so on. Uh, but of course, Phil Redman came along and, and decided to, to very much go against the grain of that. And obviously... Would, you know, in the BBC especially, but across children's telly, were doing that at the time. Yes, yeah. You know, um, Jack and Ori was going, the, you know, it, it was only one show. And I suppose what was actually threatening about it was that it was so popular. Mm -hmm the kids at that time that identified so strongly that was what was yeah. perhaps yeah I think so I suppose there's always that question mark about whether certain topics should or should not be introduced to children at a, at a certain age and I know Lucinda in your time there were some quite controversial subjects being introduced weren't there that well, some the parents would have felt the uncomfortable was the drugs, yes. which was extraordinary that they got all the way to, to the White House with this story. and that was that was remarkable. Was that, was that very carefully planned, or did this just sort of take off unexpectedly? I don't know. I think that the, the taking of the, of the drugs had not been no. seen at that but, yes, at that time. obvious and practical level. Mm -hmm. I and mean, maybe, I don't know, I really don't know how the route happened to getting to the White House, but there was, a, was there not a song? Was there was, there not yes. A song? Yeah, yeah. You just say no. And, yeah. and there was a charity, wasn't there, that, yeah. that, that, that benefited from, it from was, that? It, they got to um, the White House because your, uh, the first Bush, President Bush's wife was running the Just Say No campaign mm. in uh, America. And so when the, the, the sort of controversy, the show made a bit of a thing and then they got invited. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I wonder how the BBC felt at the time I mean, about that. told me they were taking drugs in the bathroom of the White House. Yeah, I think, <laughs> I think, it's, I think it's been documented uh, that, that that did happen and, and so on. Uh, which obviously, you know, even more, more controversy. I mean, what, yeah. about, what, about the, what about the fans? Because I guess, um, you know, people must have written to you at the, at the time and, and asked for... Because I know that Scott, who's you know, organised today, he's got some of the, uh, the cast cards that would be autographed and sent oh, yeah. out. Yeah. To we fans and, and so on. The, 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 I had two incredibly peculiar, funny experiences. Once was on a cross channel ferry when me and I had two children who were quite small in the car, and there were school trips on the same boat. And suddenly, as we were parking the car, yeah. we were spotted. And it was as if we were a little ants. I mean, we couldn't get out of the car. The children were all clambering all over the car, and my children were mortified. This is so embarrassing. Oh, God, no, this is so embarrassing. And, you know, then another time I remember running up an escalator, and the I mean, it would be like being in a, in a hunt. The, be the hounds behind me, running up the, up the escalator, because suddenly one person, it's Missy Regan! And, and they were <laughs> but I, I suppose it's, it shows how strong the audience must it have connected. Was. But, I mean, it was, ooh, it was, yeah, but it was also, I, I guess, uh, you were famous, you know, and, and, and today, you know, uh, it's less, well, today it's more accessible to be nearer stars and so on, but in those days when there were just the, the, the four channels. But the weird thing was, you were only famous amongst children. Yes, yes exactly. Was that an advantage for other work? Um, I don't think it made a difference no. either way to me. I mean, but it was, we, you know, you, you walk into a club or anywhere and nobody knows who you are, you know, apart from crime watch, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> but nobody knows who you are. But then, as you say, you get recognised 
and suddenly there's a different thing going yeah, on. Yes, yeah. I mean, I went to a thing in, uh, I was another person who was, I was at university with was a Sarah Green, who was a presenter of Blue Peter at this time. And uh, we both ended up going to this event around this time in South Wales for another friend of ours. And she was the main thing. And we got there and they were all all over me. And she wasn't very happy. And I was quite shocked by that. Yes, yeah. But people aren't going to write to Mr. Knowles. I'm, well, you've got to be careful, haven't you? Well, that's right. Now, yeah, well, I'm not be a bit guess, suspicious but... who's writing to Mr. Knowles. Yeah. I really identify with you. <laughs> okay. Um, but in my in my hometown, which is Kenilworth in Warwickshire, they didn't know. People didn't know that I was from Kenilworth, apart from the people who knew me. But in Kenilworth, coincidentally, they started a Mr. Knowles fan club, <laughs> and they all had little badges on, them, with "Will you stop following me, Mr. Nick oh. <laughs> Which was my catchphrase. Where did the walk come from? Um, they asked me to do a walk. <laughs> it was in the script that they copied his walk. So I just, so you had to do the... just bodged it together. You know. And you were on location at Hammersmith, is that yeah, right? Yeah. At a, a school? Uh, we were, it, was a, it was the Grange Hill School, yeah. and then we were, it was in Hammersmith and just the streets. There was one clip that you showed there on a street corner. And this was, I used this story uh, teaching, because uh, I teach film and telly now as well. And uh, I use this story quite a lot about locations because we were on that street corner, which was just around the corner in Hammersmith. And oh, I can't remember his second name, Phil, who subsequently became a good mate of mine. And we, I then became a director of EastEnders many years later. And Phil was my first assistant. But at this time, he was the third assistant on Grange Hill. It was his first job as a third assistant. And we were a similar age. And uh, we were on that street corner, and as we were filming, uh, a drunk who, who was Glaswegian, I mean, I'm not saying anything about it, I'm just <laughs> he happened to be Glaswegian. And he comes up, and they go, can you not walk down there, we're just filming, and they're like, yeah, 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 yeah. And um, Phil, put his hand on the bloke's chest and pushed him back. And this bloke, don't you touch me up, boy. And anyway, they, the first assistant came over, it was all calmed down. And about 20, and the guy went off. And about 20, we were still filming, 20 minutes later, the guy came back, just walked straight up the street to Phil, punched him and knocked him out <laughs> on the street. Wow. He'd obviously gone away and wound himself mm, up. Yes. And I'm probably pushing me up here. And, um, you know, this is one of my first days for me. And it just, you know, I use the story to illustrate that you've got to be very, mm, you, know, yes, you have yes. no rights to control people on the public street when they tell me. But, um, you know, it always stayed with me as it would. Yeah. You know. Because uh, you have gone on to be uh, not only a, 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 an actor, but you've also written, haven't you, episodes of, 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 of soaps, you've also been a producer yeah. and, a, and a director. So yes. were you very much using your acting experiences to uh, go over to the other side and, and, and develop that side of your work? I always wanted to direct television. That's what I wanted to do when I was a kid. Television was really important to me when I was a kid. Um, there were things about my childhood that weren't very happy. And television was really, really important. It was a window on another world. And uh, when people say there is, there wasn't a golden age, there was a golden mm -hmm. age, and they're talking bollocks. Yeah. <laughs> it's self-serving bollocks. The people who say it tend to be very successful people in television today. So they obviously don't want to think that there was a golden age because that undermines. But there was a golden age of television, and it was roughly speaking, between 1965 and 1985. And the reason why it was a golden age was because of the values of the people making it. Mm -hmm. And the even Grange Hill was one of those, mm -hmm. that there was not just a desire to make a soap about schools, but there was a desire to say something about the world. Not just the world that children existed in, 
And that contributed to the controversy. Mm. Because, uh, broadly speaking, Grange Hill had, what, if you're a right winger, what you would call the, the liberal left wing attitudes. Broadly speaking, although they weren't expressed politically, but they were socially. And a huge amount of television at the time had these aspirations to say something about the world. And I grew up watching that television and being educated in a way that, that the students I teach now are not educated for the broadness of their education. And um, it was really important to me. I thought, I thought and still think television is important. But the people in charge of it now don't. They think it's pack. We were taken over by the American uh, values. And so uh, television, I think, is, is a much diminished beast. Mm. But going back to what I was saying, I wanted to be a director in television because I thought it was important. And I like bossing people about. So that <laughs> and um, I went, so I went to Hull because they had a television studio. And in the third year, you could do a television module. Mm -hmm. That's why I went there. And um, so I did that. But while I was there, with Anthony Minghella, amongst others, I did some acting, which was very, very successful. People said to me, you should think about that. So I thought, what I'll do is I'll give it a go as an actor, and then I'll see how that goes, and then I can move into directing later. And it, it did turn out that way, but it was much, much harder than I thought to make that transfer. And for many years, I regretted it. I don't now, but I did regret it. In some ways, you're, you're quite unique, actually, because uh, actors are very much pigeonholed as, as, as actors and then moving across. I mean, there are a few examples. Obviously, Susan Tully yeah. from Grange Hill, you know, East Ender is very successful and yeah. a good example of, yeah. of that. Um, were, were some people in the industry a little bit suspicious of you because, yeah. you know, you're an actor and actors should act and, yeah. and not direct and yeah. produce it? it was really, really hard. Yes. I made some very successful short films, but still couldn't... I mean, the way people became directors over that period was very corporate. The way you became a director wasn't go to film school. Now you become a director by going to film school and coming in with a flashy film and a thing. Then, to become a television director, you had to go through about a 12-year program of training at the BBC. From the third assistant, second, first assistant, location manager, uh, first assistant, <coughs> production manager, and then you could choose to go producing or directing. And that, on average, took about 12 years to do that. So there was I, at the same age as these people who, were, who had been doing 12, had done their 12 years. But I hadn't done that. So there was a lot of resistance, and it was a lot of hard work. OK, uh, we're going to open it up now to some, some questions. I'm hoping that there are some people out there who've uh, got a burning question that they would like to ask you about, about Grange Hill or any other aspects of your career. We haven't, we haven't touched upon Lovejoy or, or Dear John uh, yet uh, at all. Anybody got any questions at all out there? OK, yes, we have one. Um, this is for both Chris and Lucinda. Um, where do you think your characters are now? Oh, yeah. <laughs> what are they doing? <coughs> like me, I'm looking for, she's a granny. <laughs> Hopefully somebody she got she finally found a good man and and a beautiful daughter, I don't know, has a happy career. I mean I would like to think she I've got grandchildren and we were the same age, so that's the way the story goes, isn't it? I should think Mr. Knowles is head of history at a <laughs> at a comprehensive somewhere. I think. And a very good teacher. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. he w well, otherwise he's dead, isn't he? Yeah. No, I think he would. By the end of the series, he, he had survived and was becoming. The, t the kids were liking him. You know, he found a sense of humour. And I think he would have. He, because the other thing you can see from even just those clips about that character um, was that he was passionate about history. Mm. And I think that would have carried him through. You know, <coughs> he had some of those values we were just talking about. 
as a character. Um, I mean, the, the Mr. Knowles from the first episode I did would have found another mm. job, yeah. without a doubt. But then they developed it, and so by the end he would have carried on, I'm sure. And Lucinda, you, you left, didn't you, uh, uh, Grange Hill, uh, and you decided to leave. Dear John. To do Dear John. You know, Dear John was going so well. In fact, there was a ghastly time when I had to juggle. To do both. Doing, you know, and they got very annoyed with me at both sides. Right. The, 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 what was it? Who was the floor manager? Whoever it was who had to work out the gesture. Okay, first assistant. Well, it was getting yeah. extremely awkward, and I could see that. Anyway. No, I, I mean I, I loved I loved Grange Hill, and in some ways I wish that I had I had stayed longer. But it's, um, I like doing both. That's yeah. the honest truth. It was lovely to do a sitcom in one season and be doing a, a, a series like that. And it was it was very successful at the time, wasn't it, dear John? It's very popular mm -hmm. comedy. Well, it was only because Ralph died. Yes. Ralph Bates died that it didn't. And as it was John Sullivan's script, it would have been destined for. Goodness knows how long. Yeah. A, a charming idea. Because hadn't he? Didn't you tell me that he'd um, become a bit tired of Only Fools and Horses around that time? That that's why he moved over to Dear John. And no, then I think he liked he liked the difference. I yeah. mean, you couldn't have been you know have two shows so different. And he he was a great mate of Ralph's. He was he was a very special man. Yes. Yeah. He had, it was like you were part of his company whether you were in Dear John or you were in Bills and Horses. Um, and that's when you were talking about television isn't what it was. Mm. I mean, there was a sign, there was there going on what we miss mm. a lot mm. was that sort of standard. It's because it was a, I mean, Bills and Horses particularly, was an incredibly high standard of writing and acting. Extraordinary. And contains ideas, yes. not just jokes. No, no I mean, it, yes, exactly. It was about, when it first started, it was very much about the 80s, about what was happening. Yeah, oh yes, yeah. It was you know, very good. I mean, what you said about how television has flattened out, it's not. I agree with you very much about that. Scott. Just want to ask both of you, you work with some of the most memorable, uh, fondly remembered kids. Do you have any memories of working with them? Um, yeah, I, I, I loved them. I thought they were great, those kids. I mean, I, you've got to bear in mind, I was 22. So the girls had come in for the rehearsals. You know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> you put some fucking clothes on, for Christ. <laughs> Have a conscience, girl. Um, but so, the, you know, we were at... They were kids, but actually, if you look at it now, I was thinking this when I was coming down, they'll probably be in their early... F I'm 57 now. No, really. <laughs> I'm 57. So those, the girls that we were playing with will be 51 or 52 now. There's no... Do you know what I mean? The age gap now is nothing. And so it's quite extraordinary. But so that was that. That was weird. Um, but they were fantastic. But uh, uh, um, and uh, oh god, what was his face? Oh, the Greek lad. Oh, is it uh, Tony? Anthony? The no. no? Greek. Yeah. His family were Greek. Fat lad. Oh, Roland. 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 Yeah, real name. Uh, okay. uh, Turkish it was, wasn't it? And um, he was a really clever kid. We, I mean, really clever. Uh, and uh, he used to negotiate his own fees and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have an agent? No, I don't have an agent. No, I saw that. You know, I said to him, fuck up, I'm not doing that. <laughs> We'll have to ask him, he's coming along today. Later. Well, uh, we'll find out then. We'll have to ask him about the negotiation of, of fees. Well, you so. ask him if he did, because he might have been bullshitting. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah. Well, I, I certainly know he didn't come from a stage school no, background. No, because uh, a lot of them came from Anna Schur. Oh, sure. And that was fantastic. They were great oh, kids. Oh, it's the one down the road here. Art Educational. Sylvia Young. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, when I was in, that main body of that main group, especially the girls, had all come from Anna Schur. Mm. That was the main They thing. were particularly remarkable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They had a it was so natural. Yes, yeah. And you talked to them and, and, and you know, some of the mums were the chaperones. Um, and, you know, the kids would be the main earners in the family. You know, doing Granger. I mean, and I thought they were amazingly well behaved. I mean, incredibly well behaved. And Kenny, who was the producer at the time, um, he'd just done a he just, God bless him, he's dead now, actually. But, you know, he, he had just done a, an American thing called EST, E-S-T, which was a sort of hippie thing about, you know, calming you down. And, well, I've never seen so about it. Somebody so fucking wired it in my life. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if this was after EST, who knows what it was like before. I mean, <laughs> and he, Kenny was always, um, I mean, really wired on the edge and was always moaning about the kids' behaviour, but they were brilliant. They, they were, you know, it was just the stress of being a director, which subsequently I came to understand where that was coming yes. from. And, uh, but they were amazing. Okay, we've got time for just one more question. Anybody got a question at all? Okay. Isn't it a shame that Grange Hill is, is no longer running in many ways? There isn't that, that children's drama about school life for, for well, children today? I, I, when I became a director, one of my dreams was to get to direct Granger. And I was doing EastEnders and Granger was being done at Elstree and I'm constantly, you know. And then, when it went back up to Liverpool, that was bizarre, wasn't it? So was, they're all scousers. Right in there. Anyway, um, when it went up to Liverpool, I then went and did a lot, a big show up there for uh, a directing, a big show for... Uh, for Mersey as it still was then. And the producer of Grange Hill was the producer of this show. And I said, come on. Yeah, yeah. This would be such a lovely circle for me to have been in Grange yes. and then directed. But unfortunately, I swear rather a lot. <laughs> <laughs> An extreme amount, actually. <laughs> and he was scared to death of uh, me effing and being in front of the kids. Quite rightly, I think, because it would have happened. But, um, <laughs> okay. Thank so. you very much. Okay, round of applause, please, for Lucinda.